So yeah, so thanks again for uh, coming in on a bank holiday Monday. Um, I think uh, uh, before moving on to some more radical things, it is, it is worth um, uh, looking at uh, schemes for codifying uh, inductive recursive definitions to give us at least some some sense that we, are, we know some things might make sense. Um, you know, we, we've got this sort of wild syntax that lets us make mutual uh, declarations, uh, and uh, yeah, there have been situations where they were insufficiently checked and some deeply paradoxical uh, constructions were written down like at one stage. We have to do a, a careful check to stop yourself writing down like a, mutually a data type V that codes up a universe which has uh, one element in it called V prime such that the meaning of V prime is V itself <laughs> uh, because at the time you know that V is in scope but it shouldn't be used so yeah so much in the same way that uh, we try to codify inductive data types via some sort of description that we had some reasonable way to interpret. Uh, it does uh, make sense to uh, consider coding uh, inductive recursive uh, definitions. So I'm going to show you uh, at least one way of doing it. This, so uh, Peter de Vieira and Anton Setz have proposed this presentation in 99. I haven't finished it yet, this is just a, a placeholder for the construction. So the idea is that we want to give an encoding of functors from fan i to fan j. Um, and uh, uh, one, one kind of uh, uh, fan j that we might deliver uh, corresponds to uh, the uh, the empty uh, the empty tuple uh, that's the set um, uh, and then we've got to be able to read off a j from that so if we're going to choose to deliver the empty tuple as our only data, then we have to just say which J it means. So the base case for this encoding of functors from fam A, from fam I to fam J is just to say, uh, well, you know, there's no more data, and now you have to say what the J is. Um, so here I'm giving it, I'm very much giving an interpretation to sets and functions. So here I say the meaning of uh, IOTA J uh, is uh, that it stands for the unit set interpreted as this particular J. The idea uh, is, as you might expect, yes I should have said this first, that we want to describe the node structure of a recursive type defined by mutual induction recursion. So what's, what's a node like? Well, it's kind of like a record, except that it's got places for substructures, for recursive substructures. So uh, the substructures are going to be fam i things, that's to say, things from which we can read an i. Um, and we're supposed to be delivering a fan J. So, yeah, so what's going to happen? There's going to be two sorts of things in uh, our nodes. There's going to be like ordinary stuff, non recursive components, like constructor choices and things like that, just sort of labels that live in nodes. And there are going to be places for substructures. 
Is that making some sort of vague sense? Yeah, so let's do the ordinary case first. We want to have an ordinary field. And we're just going to say what it is. And then, depending on one of those, depending uh, on the value of that, we get to choose the rest of the structure. Um, Two things, namely what the node data structure is going to be, and secondly, how do we really jail off from it? Um, so uh, that's going to be in two pieces. Line uh, up in the same way. Well, uh, it's supposed to be a record structure whose first component is an A, so how about Start like that. Um, and then uh, the rest of it is going to be whatever set we get from instantiated T. So that's going to be the first component of uh, what we get when we interpret T of A at the same input family. Okay. And so that's what the data is going to be. You know, the first field that we specify and then whatever you get when you interpret the rest. Uh, and then someone is actually going to give us some data. And we have to explain how to compute a J from it. The good news is that we actually know, I mean, given from the second component of this thing, the second component of this tells us how to compute a J from a T structure. So we're going to win. <coughs> Second component, I feed it to T, and we're home. So all that was the first component just told us which one of the T structures we were going to use. So then we, uh, the data is just recording that choice and then recording the T structure, and then the interpretation just interprets the T structure according to the choice. So you can see, uh, if, you've, if you're a, a kind of um, uh, algebraic frets, free monad sort of person, uh, this is like uh, the return of the free monad where you're actually saying what j we're going to give back. And uh, then this thing is like issuing a command that goes, give me an a! And then you get back an A and you carry on figuring out how to figure out what the J is that you're going to return. Um, uh, yeah, so that's how we deal with the non recursive fields. Um, but uh, then we need to consider uh, recursive fields. Uh, and this is usually. Dibger and sets are called this constructor uh, delta. And let's, um, let's do the, um, uh, uh, the simple case first and then figure it out to be more general. 
we're going to ask for some recursive, uh, some recursive stuff. Um, and then we want to say how the rest of the structure will depend on it. And the thing about working over a fan is that even though we're sort of abstract in the actual representation of the recursive stuff, we do know something useful about it. We know that whatever it is, there'll be a way of interpreting it as an I. You know, whatever the concrete thing is, there'll be a function that gives us an I from it. So in particular, if we make a place for uh, recursive data, we know that the rest of the structure can be computed given the value of the I that we read up from it. Very close to what the set sort of broke down, except 
that instead of uh, if we if we chose this, we would only be able to give uh, first order structures. So, for example, we saw up uh, oh in here, you see uh, oh we have an example as well yeah. here. We're not just choosing a single recursive substructure. We're choosing a collection of recursive substructures branching over some other set. So we haven't encoded that ability to do high order branching, but that's not that tricky. We just say what set would we like uh, to branch over. So instead of getting one element, we're going to get H many elements, a function from H to elements, and correspondingly we'll get to uh, depend on a function from H to I. For each child position we'll be able to get an interpretation. Um, and then what do we have to do here? Uh, we have to say, well actually we're going to have a function from H to X. Collection of children, and then that's going to be so someone's going to give us a function from h to x, uh, and then uh, the rest of it, instead of applying xi to x, we get our function that we depend on from composition. Instead of applying to one, we compose with a function that gives us a bunch of them, but other than that. Uh, everything should be okay, except that we didn't rename that for the page. So that's, this is the, the scheme for writing down uh, inductive recursive definitions which the VR assessor gave us in, uh, in 99. You can go back and encode our earlier little examples uh, in terms of this scheme. Um, and then we can make a data type declaration which uh, ties the knot and you can see it not complaining about this definition because I told it not to um, at the top of the file um, but, uh, but this is sort of intuitively what's supposed to be going on okay so we, we take a code where it so happens that the meanings of node structures and of elements are the same sort of thing. It's going to be important if we're going to make a recursive definition. Uh, so we, we're expecting to have elements from which we can read off the same thing that we're reading off for nodes. Okay. So we're going to define a data type and a decoder. And we feed in that data type itself and the decoder as the family parameter to the interpretation. And then the first component of that is the set that represents one node of data. So that's the argument for the construction of the data type. And then we use the second component of the same thing to tell us how to interpret one node of data as a map. So we do indeed have simultaneously a data type and a decoder. Uh, and at this point, uh, if you don't uh, disable it, maybe I'll disable the disabling uh, just for the models. Um, uh, right, so it complains that this is not uh, a strictly positive definition because it cannot see why this recursive reference is only used in a strictly positive position uh, uh, because there's, uh, in the various components of this uh, there are lots of things going on uh, you can fix the positivity problem if you just take this interpretation and instead of taking a fan to a fan, you separate out the two components of the input fan 
and you write two functions that separately deliver the two components of the output file. At which point, the positivity checker can then see that all the recursive uses of the data type are okay, and then the termination checker kills you because, hey, hang on a minute, here is a recursive call that isn't even applied to anything at all, never mind only applied to things that are you know, not obviously structurally smaller. So it's just, uh, it's a, it's a, a, a hopeless situation expecting this to, to go as planned. Is it the same trick as parametric uh, high order syntax to uh, uh, I don't know. Just declare the, uh, the function that maps uh, one type to another and then later on parametrize the whole. Yeah, but yeah, so I mean, it, oh, time and again, you find you have to inline, you have to specialize the interpretation. Yeah. Uh, if that's the same trick, then yes. So what you end up doing is uh, you build, it, as part of this mutual definition, you end up building a specialized copy of this thing, yeah. which uh, doesn't need to take a fan eye as its input and just uses uh, the recursive data type and decoder. And that's enough uh, for uh, yeah, so the termination checker, the termination and positivity checkers are both happy with the specific instance that we actually use. They're just too stupid to see that uh, that's the only way in which we're using it, so it's okay. Uh, so it's annoying just to have to do specialization by hand to tell these checkers to shut up. Uh, but that, that's the way out of it. So in the notes. Uh, I've actually done that, and uh, uh, it's uh, uh, you know everything is, is completely you know by the book. One thing I I want to say before moving on, um, yeah. So we noticed a moment ago that there was this sort of monadic structure to this definition. Um, uh, so we can say either give me an A or give me a bunch of I's in order to figure out how to give back a J. Um, correspondingly, there's a, a, a bind operation uh, for that, uh, which uh, grafts a new bit of node structure on at the tip of, uh, of a previous one. And so that induces a notion of dependent pairing of node structures. You can kind of cut up, um, uh, you can, uh, when, you, when you graft on a new piece of node structure, uh, depending on uh, the value in the structure so far. Uh, uh, you've, uh, you've basically said, you know, these things have a notion of, of sigma type. So uh, there's an exercise in the notes where you get to build the notion of pairing and projection that are induced by the monadic structure of the, this encoding. Uh, but crucially, uh, the thing to consider is that the leaves uh, in these effectively kind of higher order tree structures, the leaves correspond to end of node where you have to deliver the decoding value, the, de uh, the interpretation. They do not correspond to the places where the elements are. So you get an easy uh, sort of record extension structure, but you don't get anything so convenient when it comes to uh, specializing the notion of element. But in particular, uh, we have this amusing situation. So I've shown you a notion, uh, a type DSIJ, which encodes a variety of functors 
uh, from fan i to fan j. And I've shown you the action on objects of those functions. I haven't shown you uh, the action on morphisms. Uh, but it's, uh, it's definable. Um, you might think it would be nice if, given two such representations of functors, it would be possible to represent their composition. So here we've got, um, uh, oh, whoops, <laughs> that's just so uh, uh, that, that makes the problem harder. <laughs> so, so, uh, Uh, I 
I want to be functional over some type S, and depending on which value of S we get, we'll explain what the structure of the rest of, of, of uh, uh, the substructure is. And I want a sigma, and in the style of induction recursion, I'm going to say, I'm going to say, say which Irish code is used for the first component, and then depending on the information available for that, I'm going to give the structure of the second component. So this is much more like the kind of closure under sigma that we had in our universe earlier. And then the interpretation doesn't straight away tell you the node structure. If you can see it's large. Uh, what it does tell you is the information you're sure to be able to get from the node structure, even though you don't yet know what type is going to instantiate the elements. So crucially here, when the code says, give me an element, you don't know what type of element you're going to get, but you do know you will be able to read off an I from it. So that information will be available. And then, um, what information can you get from an A? Well, you can get an A. Uh, what information can you get from a function type? You can get a function that gives you some information. What information can you get from a sigma type? Well, you can get a pair of pieces of information. Um, and then the crucial thing to get the node structures uh, are, well, you have to say, uh, for a given notion of element type, what the node structure is going to be, and how you're going to deliver the information. Um, so then, to, um, uh, to boil it back down to something from fan i to fan j, you say, well, I'm going to choose a node structure whose element types give me i's, and then I'm going to explain how, given uh, the information that you can get from that node structure, how to compute a J. Uh, okay, so this is a bit, bit of a rush, uh, but taking a fixed point, we end up with a small data type. I mean, and my point is, this is actually much closer to the inductive recursive definitions we have written down. Uh, if you think, if you look at we, when we were actually making explicit inductive recursive definitions in ACTA, we would write a data type describing a node structure, and then we would write a function interpreting it. And then somehow when they did the set of encoding, those two things are woven together into one kind of monadic computation of the interpretation. Uh, and here I've pulled them apart again. I say, uh, you say what the node structure is, and then the encoding figures out what information that's going to give you, and then you say, how to deliver the, the information you actually need separately as a function. So I thought this was kind of quite a nice little rearrangement. But it turns out that uh, this, um, this presentation of induction recursion is obviously closed under <laughs> and that's an exercise. Uh, so in particular, because we've got a leaf represented, uh, a leaf constructor corresponding to element places, not just end of node, uh, substitution for a leaf, substitution of a whole structure for where an element goes, well, that's composition. So there's a syntactic notion of substitutional codes, uh, which directly has the property that the interpretation of the substitution is the composition of the interpretation. Uh, so we, I mean, that's the thing, right? At the time when I came up with this, I thought, well, can I turn all of uh, Debeer and Setzer's codes uh, into mine? And the answer is yes. And that's an exercise, and not terribly difficult. Well, I didn't bother trying the other way around. And um, uh, open problem, uh, don't know. Uh, 
so yeah, so if it turns out that you discover that Debian sets or codes are uh, uh, definitely not, you find a kind of example, if you show they're not closed under composition, then we know that the Irish codes are, are more, which means we also won't know whether the Irish codes are consistent, because that means we'll need a whole new model. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, it's an interesting times in the world of, of induction recursion. Um, uh, yes, uh, as a kind of footnote to that, I would also observe that Peter Hancock has been experimenting with a different coding of induction recursion, which he calls uniform induction recursion, and what he has done is exactly the thing Randy Pollock did with records. Instead of giving a right-nested presentation of the node structures, he gave a left-nested presentation of the node structures. And we noticed that those left-nested presentations had, were, uh, they corresponded to variable binding rather than the full-on computational function space. Yes, it's that distinction again. Uh, and uh, yeah, the left method ones being be more uniform um, uh, are uh, uh, you know, uh, easier to manipulate. And indeed, these left method Debian sets of codes, the uniform codes, are also closed under composition. So the question is sort of what's What's unruly about right nestedness that's uh, that's getting in the way? Yes, and then you'll notice well if you look at the type of sigma in the Irish codes, then you can have you can have nested uh, encoded structures either to the left, well both to the left and to the right instead of. Uh, sets to the left in the right nested structures and sets to the right in the right nested structure. So, uh, yeah, this is some. Um, uh, this is a bit of the building that is still being built. So, this is the consistency um, over the sets of things. Is that going to be a large card model? Yeah. The, the so, so, is it going to be an Irish version of a large card model? Yes, a large, <laughs> yeah, a large Irish car and all this. Yes, it's a bad thing here, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> dear, dear, dear. Uh, let's move on. <laughs> so, <laughs> I've got uh, 20 minutes to talk about observational quality. Um, which is, of course, where this lecture is supposed to start. Hey, buffer, buffer overruns are good. Right? <laughs> Especially given the amount of preparation I've done for that. So. Uh, but, um, right. So I do have a handy file. Um, maybe, maybe I'll do the propaganda now and leave the actual solution to the problem as a, as a clip. We were talking earlier about uh, these sorts of uh, uh, right of the colon indexy things and what they let you do and why maybe you should think twice about them. Um, so here's one. Here's a predicate uh, on functions from nap to nap that defines my favorite endo functor, endo function on the natural function. Lambda x zero plus x, which if you define the plus by recursion on its first argument, is the identity function. But, uh, this example is constructed for people who are neutral in, uh, <laughs> uh, or to be neutral in terms of that particular prejudice. So I can prove a property of the natural numbers. Um, yeah, that uh, 0 plus x equals x plus 0, and that's just reflexivity and plus 0 x. Oh, what's going on in the large? Maybe I should be so casual as I'm going to get this, uh, uh, get this out. Uh, maybe I'll just do this. Let's 
So, that's an unexpected nuisance, but... Uh, what is all this rewrite rubbish anyway? Yeah, it's, it's just <laughs> get, rubbish. Get rid of that. You don't need that. Yeah. Do it yourself. Uh, <laughs> so, Extensionality. I mean, if you have two functions and they agree on all inputs, then let's say a function. Um, okay, so let's. What is the definition of com? Uh, of where? Uh, com. Uh, com says uh, if you have one function and two equal arguments to apply it to, you will get equal results. Okay. That's not an accident, that's, uh, uh, that's provable. Yeah. Uh, but sadly, so are the uh, postulates, <laughs> yeah. uh, but the morally ought to be orange. Um, yeah. uh, the, uh, yes. So if we assume extensionality, then we can actually prove this thing um, with uh, you know, appealing only to, to postulates rather than to open uh, hypotheses. Uh, so we have something which is kind of morally closed, um, and and then we kind of we can construct a term uh, by uh, by substituting with this equation this concrete value favorite in my own favorite type. So uh, if I say, well, what is the type of my term? It says, well, you know. That's my favorite function is lambda x, x plus zero. But, you know, what, what is the value that this must be, this thing has got a closed term of this type? Um, well, let's, uh, let's normalize my term and uh, <laughs> discover that we don't really get very far. <laughs> And, you know, that, that's not an accident. I mean, it's not just because we were being a bit dumb about how to find a normal form. I mean, look at the data type, right? If there is going to be a canonical normal form in that type, the type of, let's have it back, the type of my term, it's going to be a constructor of the favorite family. And there only is one constructor of the favorite family. Maybe this this favorite thing here. And if we try and build no, um, hey, it's the only way I ever could be code in my end of five. Right? You want to you know build a to that type and our some favourite, it says, well, nah. <laughs> um, and why not? Because the judgmental equality is too stupid to see why those things are the same. So what we've been able to do in a rather kind of slippery way is to write down our predicate, which it doesn't enable us to make a computational distinction between an extension and the equal functions. But nonetheless, when it comes down to closed values, this favorite predicate holds for one implementation of a function and fails to hold for a different implementation of the same function. That's to say, it's an intentional predicate. So, uh, if you want the notion of equality for functions uh, to be extensional, and you want equality to mean what Leibniz says it means, namely it might be respected by all predicates, then you better make sure that you can't define uh, intentional predicates. And that's what this form of you know, 
instantiating constructor return types on the right hand side gives you. It gives you the ability to construct intentional predicates. And that's why I don't like it. Um, if you um, readjust things, in the style of Henry Ford, instead of saying, my favorite function is lambda x is 0 plus x, it's my favorite function is any function you like, as long as it's lambda x 0 plus x. Uh, uh, then uh, we're not much better off. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, but you made, so, you made a moral step forward. Uh, but, uh, but let's think about it. Uh, oh, what happened there? Oh yes, that's the same thing. That's favorite f. That's the same. Um, yeah. Um, right. So the point though is uh, that uh, what's going on with this goal? So the, when we have favorite. Uh, well, let me first of all just. Um, just check. If I normalize my term, it's still stuck. But now, there is uh, a candidate for the solution. Which is canonical. So the problem is not that there's no such term anymore that will witness the proof of this non-extensional property. Just that subst isn't computing it for us. And if you think about it, well, what does subst do? Um, it, it waits for the equation concerned to become true according to the judgmental equality. Well, actually, it waits even longer than that. It waits for the proof of the equation to become refl, which is at least as long as it takes for the equation to become true by the judgmental equality. Some, it's conceivable that one can re-implement subst, ignoring the proof, just running the definitional equality on the two things that are supposed to be equal. And then you would have a sort of slightly lazier implementation of the same thing. But you still have the property that because the judgmental equality holds on the two values, the, the thing you're trying to transport between equal types is itself now of the right type that it can just be given straight back as the result. So subst is the business of subst is to transport the value between equal types. And its computational mechanism says, well, we will wait for this value itself to be returnable at the target time. Which means that you know, that computation mechanism is never going to get any better than respecting the judgment of the court. You know, this, this is a strategy that's only good for that notion of equality. So that's how we're computing. There's just no way to make propositional equality better than judgment. Um, I mean, you notice that when we transported favorite refl to something in the allegedly extensionally equal time, it became favorite something else. It got transported, but it didn't stay exactly as it was in doing so. That's the thing that in order to build uh, a computational mechanism that will respect extensional equality, we're going to have to consider how to transport values between equal types in a way that might not be uh, completely, uh, completely trivial.
hopefully, um, but I mean, it depends on, I mean, you know, here we enter kind of worlds of, uh, you know, what should equality be, and what, how should we be transporting values between equal types. Uh, so one approach is just to say, uh, you know, equality, you know, equal types, sh types should be equal if they're isomorphic, and there should, so we should consider arbitrary computational processes that will get us from one type to another. Uh, and that's kind of the uh, Vovodsky program, uh, which uh, has not yet delivered uh, a computational interpretation of, uh, of substitutivity. Although I, I don't think there's a deep reason why it hasn't. I think it's just tricky. Uh, I think they'll get it. Uh, uh, but a while ago, Torsten Altenkirch and I made a simplifying assumption and also basis for optimization uh, that we wanted to consider only those transportations between types that uh, preserved uh, the uh, canonical structure of values. So we wanted um, we wanted types to be equal if. Uh, there was a way to transport values between them that didn't actually do anything at, in, for, for closed values. So, because we wanted to be able to erase it, we wanted to be able to say, well, you know, all of this stuff, this equality reasoning, it's just, you know, what we do to stick open terms together because the computer is too stupid to see why one open term is equal to another because it can't do algebra, it can only do computation. But at runtime, all of these coercions disappear. Uh, so if you're interested in that model of type equality, then we have actually been able to make some progress. Um, so um, let me uh, let me kind of sketch how it goes. Um, uh, the crucial thing is that to figure out how to transport values between equal types, you need to be able to look at the types. So that's why it's kind of handy to have uh, a universe of the types that we are considering. Uh, so I'm proposing to consider this tree universe that we built earlier with 0, 1, 2, sigma and pi and uh, the indexed tree types induced by index So that TU doesn't have uh, propositional quality types in it, does it? No. So, is that a problem then? Uh, well, you were about to say this isn't. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, right. Okay. So the, the prospectus is is this uh, that we will compute a notion of propositional equality, which I'm going to split into two parts. One is to say when types are equal, and that's going to be a computed type. So given two types, x and y, I'm going to compute the type of evidence that they are, that their data are interchangeable. You should think of x and y being equal if uh, there's a constructor preserving isomorphism between them. That really, you know, these things are runtime interchangeable without doing it. Um, and then I'm going to explain um, uh, how, given two elements not necessarily in the same type, when they can be considered equal. And the reason why I'm considering uh, heterogeneous equality on values is just this. But we've already seen that uh, because the judgmental equality is too stupid to recognize uh, why uh, some equations may, you know, are true, correspondingly, if you've got two values that you want to, to form an equation between, it might just be that the judgmental equality is too stupid to see why their types are the same and that these things should be comparable. Uh, 
So, uh, so that's why I find it it's useful to just say, well, you know, never mind whether the judgmental equality and see why it makes sense to compare these things. Let's just decide how that's going to work. And there are various ways in which you can do it. One approach is to say that this proposition, that, that this equation should hold uh, when the types are equal and the values are equal. So you say, well, if you know this much, then you certainly know that big X and big Y are the same type. That's one way of doing it. The other way of doing it uh, is to say that what this means morally is if the types are equal, then the values are equal. So that's to say uh, that the information is only useful if you already know why the types are equal. You see what I'm saying here? Yeah? So, in particular, if the types are obviously different, then this can be vacuously true. Value equality can be vacuously true, but it's no good to you. Uh, so this is slightly uh, uh, counterintuitive. But the reason for making that choice is that it's less bureaucratic. You don't have to store enough evidence to show that the types are equal, as well as the values. You just concentrate on, on the values. Um, yeah. And then, uh, how do we make use of this? Well, we should be able to implement uh, something that really witnesses that transportability. Something that says, well, for any two types, if we have the evidence that they are interchangeable, we should be able to transport values of one to values of the other. And this is really going to do some serious work. But because it has access to the representations of the types in the universe, it can look at the things it's trying to transport, or the, the structure of the things it's trying to transport, and figure out how to do it. And then the other thing that we'll need, which I currently have given as a postulate is just that this transportation between provably equal types doesn't do anything. So here is an example, by the way, of an equation where we have reason to believe the types are equal because look, there it is. But uh, we nonetheless, you know, the, the judgmental equality does not know that x and y are the same thing. And so in order to compare elements of x with elements of y, we need value equality to be heterogeneous. So what this is saying is that uh, the result of the coercion is the same as, you know, the output of the coercion is the same as the input. Um, so coercion gives you the corresponding thing in the interchangeable. So, I uh, clearly don't have time to do this, uh, but yes, the construction, it's, it's slightly easier to see what's going on if you build type equality and value equality simultaneously. Uh, so for any two types, you say when they are equal and when their values are equal. Um, and, and then to separate those two components. Uh, and it just goes uh, by, uh, I only recently learned you could do this by the way, you type two variables and you do control C, control C, and it gives you the massive double case analysis. Why don't they tell you these things? Um, and then you spend a lot of time deleting the off there on cases. Um, is false. 
But the equation between two values, R and that will be true because, you know, true but useless, because the types are obviously different. Oops. What happened there? That's why I want error on the keyboard. Okay. Uh, and then, well, we can fill in a few of these. Does zero equal zero? I think it might just. And I think we can be optimistic and say all the elements of the empty type are equal to each other. Similarly, I think 2 is equal to 2. But when are two elements of two equal? Well, we're going to have to look at the line. So let's write backslash there. I think true should be equal to true, and false should be equal to false. And otherwise, So you kind of work through this on a case-by-case basis. Um, uh, to say, um, when are two signal types the same? Uh, when, uh, which are going to be when, uh, when the first components are equal, and then you think, what am I going to do with the second components? And this is a little, little shuffle you can do to make that work. You, just go, you can't. You can't talk about, a, you know, when you've got two types that are provably equal, you can't talk about a thing in that type, even though kind of morally there's only one type because they're equal. But you can talk about a thing in each type, which are equal to each other. Yeah, so instead of talking about one thing, you talk about two equal things. And then it becomes clear how to talk about dependent stuff. Uh, and then you can say, when you get done to functions, then you can say, well, when are two functions equal? I mean, when is a function in pi st equal to a function in pi s prime t prime? Well, if, you know, two such functions are equal if they take equal things in s of s prime, two equal things in the corresponding range types. Um, uh, so you just say this has to be the extension out to. Um, and then we have to build the uh, computational interpretation. And then we get to have lots of fun. Three in a row. Control C, Control C. And uh, what's it moaning about? Because it doesn't know what that is yet. Uh, okay, you have to finish the definition before you can do that. But then the marvelous thing is that that this line automatically kills all the other angle cases for you. <laughs> <laughs> So it's a lovely piece of automation um, once, once you've uh, finished that. Right. And the crucial thing, it's a pity actually, but it's good. If we just go that far, um, then uh, so you sit there and you can kill all the odd diagonal ones by hand. And, uh, yeah. But here, when you get you get really faced with the prospect, you have to say what to do. Yeah, that's an S in sigma S T. That's sigma S prime T prime. And that's an S in T. And yeah, no, I haven't finished that six. Uh, that's, um, uh, right. Uh, here you are, faced with the goal of delivering an S prime T prime. Um, all you have is an S and a T, and then you have a Q of some type or other. So now figure out what you need. And then that might help you decide what to put in the corresponding model up here. I mean, that, that's just how they do it. You end up with a definition that looks kind of complicated, but you don't really have much choice about it. You know, you just look at you know, 
you're completely informed by the business of trying to ship data from one type to another. And too often, what do I need? Um, uh, okay, uh, I, I want to make uh, one more remark. Well, uh, I shall do the Blue Peter thing uh, and say uh, when it comes to what the definition uh, of observational equality is. Here's one I built earlier. Uh, the, uh, the coercion function, that's an exercise uh, for you. Uh, but I want to emphasize uh, one fact, uh, which is, well, there was kind of, the, the sort of, there's no choice aspect of it. When you're choosing the types that represent the evidence for interchangeability uh, and for value equality. Uh, you know, which type forms do you need to represent that evidence? Uh, well, sometimes the equations are trivial, so we're going to need one. And sometimes they're, uh, they're impossible, so we're going to need zero. And sometimes there are components of things. I'm going to need to talk about what happens in each component. So we need sigma, and sometimes there are higher order things. So we need pi. But do we ever need two? Do we ever need to say, well, you know, there might be two ways these things are equal? When we're kind of straight down the line, structural equality. In terms of we don't ever need to offer two ways these things are Similarly, it turns out that we don't need trees of equality evidence because given two trees you can just compute by their well finding this sort of big duple of facts that you need to see why those trees are equal. So although uh, we um, uh, although we don't um, have uh, although we have other types at our disposal we only use 0, 1, sigma and pi uh, to uh, construct the types of equality evidence. And that's quite interesting, because if you think about how to pattern match on those types, uh, well, you haven't got a way to pattern match on function types at all, you can just apply functions. Uh, you can pattern match on one and sigma, but those are always tra uh, translated in terms of projections. Right? You never actually those, those pattern matches are all lazy. You can try it. If you write a pattern matching function with void as a pattern on the left hand side, and you apply it to some hypothetical, some variable of unit type, that function will produce anyway. As it should, because according to the eta rule for unit, that variable is equal to void. So there would be something wrong if it didn't produce. So that reduces lazily. Similarly, pattern matching on pairs is really just a sugar for projection. So the only kind of pattern matching that is even remotely strict in those types is pattern matching, is the absurd pattern for uh, the, uh, uh, the empty type. And there, we're not waiting for a constructor to turn up. We are rather just smugly observing that there can't be one. So the point then is that when you write a function that computes using the proof that two types are equal, there is no way you can even build such a thing that is strict in the proof. There's just no mechanism of pattern matching that allows you to say, I'm going to wait for the proof to take a particular form and get stuck. Which is great, because then we can throw it, we can write postulates like coherence and be sure that even though we haven't sort of finished off the exercise and filled in all the bits and pieces, the computation mechanism of coercion is still going to take canonical values to as long as we haven't introduced a source of false equations that would give us uh, a closed proof of absurdity uh, to
to transport between two different types. But while we're still transporting according to proofs of true equations, even if those proofs are full of postulates, the computational mechanism will still compute. Uh, so although uh, we can't actually get rid of those postulates because ACTA isn't extensional, nonetheless, uh, this machinery for delivering that computational implementation of observation of the quality in ACTA does actually work. So yeah, that's uh, that's kind of the message I wanted to get across. <laughs>